Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When we choose an ideological framework, we employ a system of ideas and ideals to bolster our self-styled morality. We want so desperately to have power over others that we create a false reality in which we are always right, always the victim, always justified, and always able to find the culprit. Instead of child abuse at the border, we see criminals getting what they deserve. If a lie suits us, we call it true. If a person challenges us, we argue on the basis of self-styled ideals that they are evil. Up is down, black is white, John the Baptist has a demon, and Jesus is a drunkard. We say whatever we want based on whatever we believe because we worship our own thoughts. There's a word for that in the Bible. It's called idolatry, and the Gospel of Matthew was written to smash it. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 11 to 19. A quick shout-out to Father Dustin Lyon, a regular listener who suggested that a reed shaken in the wind from last week's episode may refer to a symbol printed on Herodian coins, a point, Father Lyon explains, which may enhance our reading of the text. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 288 of the Bible as Literature podcast. One of the interesting things about John the Baptist as a character in the New Testament, and here I'd like to go back to our discussion of the Gospel of Mark, John the Baptist functions as a metaphor for the Apostle Paul, and there is language that connects these two characters. There are events that connect these two characters. The fact that John the Baptist was beheaded, which was a dignity reserved for Roman citizens like Paul. But it goes further because in the broader story of the New Testament, there are parallels between Jesus and Paul. And here in Matthew, the language that the evangelist brings to bear on John the Baptist, especially in the application of the prophet Malachi, sounds like he's talking about the Messiah. And remember, Rich, Malachi comes in the canon just before the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. Right. In the Christian canon, Malachi just finished when Matthew started. So there's a way that in the final form of the Bible, you would read this right after Malachi, so it makes sense that you would have that connection. And Malachi is saying that this is my messenger who's coming, who's bringing this word of judgment, and then who's the next person you meet? It's John the Baptist. So you have a connection as you're reading this in the canonical order of the Bible when you move from the Old Testament to the New Testament when you're reading in the Christian canon. And then I think it's beautiful the way that Jesus uses John in order to continue this idea of teaching the people not to believe their eyes. You and I have been going on for a long time talking about how people are not able to question what they see with their eyes. It's amazing. We see terrible things happening in the world, and people are somehow able to not notice them. We see things happening politically. We see things happening in war. And because of an ideology, people can make black white and white black. It's really awful how people use their ideologies in order to force a certain view of the world onto those around them. And it's really disgusting to see that this ideology flies in the face of facts. Jesus is co-opting this because the same was happening in the Roman Empire. I mean, it's human beings. They're stupid. 
they take an ideology and they impose it on anything. I was reading recently a so-called Bible study, and it was using Hebrew words, and the Hebrew words absolutely could not mean what the author was saying. He was using an ideology from politics in order to create meanings for Hebrew words. I mean, it's disgusting what people do. Jesus is co-opting this mechanism, and he's forcing the listener to see things not according to what they see. He's forcing them to reckon with their ideology. And he says, either your ideology or my ideology. They cannot coexist. Jesus's ideology is not abstract. It's what is written in Scripture. If you're going to listen to Jesus Christ, you must follow what is said in Scripture. And you are not allowed to make up meanings of Hebrew words. I mean, for heaven's sake. John the Baptist starts out teaching the message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus begins his ministry, he begins with the same words that John the Baptist uses. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is using John as an example for the disciples so they can begin to understand they are not able to see John correctly because of their stupid ideology. They think John the Baptist is supposed to be a king like they think he's supposed to be a king, or a wimp like they think he's supposed to be a wimp, or a prophet like they think he's supposed to be a prophet. They don't get it. John wants to know what Jesus is teaching. That's why he sent his disciples. It wasn't enough for him to hear about the events. He needed to hear the teaching. The thing about ideology, whether it's born out of fear and defensiveness because people are afraid or irritated or alienated by other people's ideas. And those other ideas are usually stupid also. I don't want to appear ever to be taking sides in a stupid argument. Sometimes they embrace ideology because they want to go beyond being defensive and exercise some kind of power over their perceived enemy. Ultimately, what happens is that your ideology becomes your idol. The language of scripture is idolatry. And human beings construct a system of thought and choose to view the world through the lens of that system of thought. And this is what Scripture is trying to smash. These are the gods that are made by the hand of man, expressed as the temples of stone and so forth. It becomes the false reality that controls your experience in the world. Just this week, a colleague sent me an article from The New Yorker that talked about politicians who are not Jewish accusing Jews who are critical of their policy of being anti-Semitic. This makes no sense whatsoever, unless within your theological framework, your ideology, you have chosen to redefine anti-Semitic as meaning anyone who disagrees with me. People are throwing mud at each other using these words that are charged with emotion and bring all kinds of historical baggage, and they're recontextualizing them in their ideology, and none of it makes any sense, and all of it is losing meaning. And this breakdown in our discourse is dangerous because we've lost the ability to say, hey, this is immoral. You can't cross this line. People are blind to cruelty. They are blind to vulgarity because they're viewing and experiencing everything through their false idol. The Torah is consistently smashing idols. I think you're absolutely correct, Father. The way that you would say ideology in scriptural terms would be idolatry. It's taking your idea of who or what saves you and fashioning something with your own hands, setting it in front of you, and saying, this is what's going to save me. Calling somebody a racist or calling someone an anti-Semite is not smashing idols. I want to be clear. When you make those accusations in the public square, you are slinging mud in order to build yourself up. These are the tactics of bullies, and there are bullies on both sides of the aisle. And that's why there's a loss of trust. If you sling mud, you're no different than any old Roman patrician slinging mud at cripples and prostitutes. It's despicable. In scripture, the teacher smashes idols by presenting the teaching of the destruction of Jerusalem expressed in the crucifixion of Jesus in the New Testament, which is a self-critique. You dismantle the idol in your disciple by dismantling your own idolatry. And I go back to the basic example we have given repeatedly, and I think it's hard, Rich, for this point to sink into people's brains, that the New Testament was written 
by a school of Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee. Galatians is a letter from a Pharisee. To this minute, there isn't a Christian anywhere in the world who doesn't think of the Pharisees as the bad guys in the story. And that's the power that our hypocrisy and our fundamentalism and our cruelty in the way that we express religiosity is ultimately judged by the teaching of the Pharisee in the New Testament, who is presented as the worst version of what we are. Having said that, it must not be lost on anyone that there is a metaphoric, functional interoperability in the Bible between John the Baptist and Paul the Pharisee. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. When I hear this text, Richard, I go immediately to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul presents himself as the least of the apostles, second only to the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, in the upside-down Roman household of Jesus Christ, the patrician is the least, so that the authority he exercises comes not from him, but from the teaching of the Father. Upside down is correct, because among them that are born among women, there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Well, visually, this doesn't make sense. He's a beggar in the middle of the desert. How do you say there's no one who is greater than that? Well, the people who like John the Baptist, who listen to John the Baptist, they could say, see, yeah, we were on the right side. Yeah, no, we had the right guy. No, we we're with the right guy. See, Jesus is with us. Jesus agrees with us. We understood John the Baptist, not like these other people who don't understand. But then Jesus takes those people and manhandles them and said, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In the kingdom of heaven, he's the bottom. The people who become self-righteous because they didn't believe in John the Baptist, they're not listening. The people who became self-righteous because they did listen to John the Baptist, Jesus is attacking by saying that the person who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you can't even comprehend. The one who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one that Jesus has been talking about all this time. In the Sermon on the Mount, who is most righteous, no human eye can see their righteousness. Only God can see their righteousness. You are not allowed to say John the Baptist is good, is bad, is evil, is righteous. You cannot say. You can't see. Only God knows. And that isn't because, oh, God can judge the heart. No, no, no. It's because you are privy to so little of what is happening in the world, you don't have enough context to even say whether this makes sense or not. You don't even know. Your ideology is built on sand. There's nothing there. When John the Baptist says that he is the least in the kingdom of heaven, it's because once you believe that he is the greatest, John the Baptist is your Messiah, and you're going to march into battle, or if John the Baptist is killed, you're going to go and lynch the governor or something for killing this person who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, blah, blah, blah. But Jesus undermines that. Jesus is doing everything he can to smash every last idol so that no ideology is left standing. There isn't a listener of our podcast who doesn't inhabit an ideological framework in which people who have wealth and people who have status are not important. In the default ideological framework that comes out of human biology, when we hear that someone is great, we cannot help but think of greatness in terms of strength and prestige. It is impossible to dismantle that most basic ideological framework because it's instinctual. Just the fact that he called John the Baptist great, just the fact that he said there was no one greater than John the Baptist is already confusing because we can't hear this word in Greek, megas, which Americans understand it's mega, like mega mall. We can't hear that word without thinking of something big and impressive and prestigious and mighty. He's defining greatness once again in a different way. He's creating 
a counter ideology so that every time we see greatness, we are not impressed. And every time we see something that looks like weakness, we look closer because it may very well manifest the kingdom of the heavens. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. We just heard that the definition of greatness in the kingdom is reframed in terms of who is least, who is small, who is the lesser. And now we're hearing about the very people that we are normally impressed with, violent men who want to take the kingdom of God by force. John the Baptist is announcing the kingdom of heaven is at hand, just like we said from Malachi. Now it's time to enter. So what happened? Everybody clamored to enter. Everyone was trying to force their way in. Everyone was trying to shoulder and elbow their way in so they could get into this kingdom of heaven violently. They didn't care who they walked over or walked around. They didn't care how they got in. They just needed to get in. But there's a problem with this. They thought they heard John the Baptist. They thought they understood John the Baptist. They couldn't understand. How do you get into the kingdom of heaven? They weren't listening. They just heard that there is the kingdom of heaven, and they decided to get in on their own terms. They're not able to see what's actually happening. They're not able to see what the kingdom of heaven is. They can't even understand who the person is who said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They can't hear what he was saying. Because to understand what the kingdom of heaven means, it means the kingdom that's coming from the words of Malachi, where God is coming to purify, to judge, to test. You're going to be tested based on whether your actions are consistent with the teaching of God in its entirety. Not just that you want really badly to get into the kingdom of heaven, but are you consistent with what is being taught? How do you take it by force? Every parable where people are taking the kingdom by force is bad news for them because the kingdom belongs to God. You don't take the kingdom from God unless you're an idolater and you want to put another God in his place. Here's how you take the kingdom by force. You create an argument in your mind that justifies you. And on the basis of that argument, you extrapolate that you are justified in your mistreatment of others, and you go further to say that you are doing the right thing when you mistreat them, you ultimately commit all kinds of cruelties and abuse and feel completely self-content with what you've done. This is what the banality of evil looks like. Ultimately, the people who commit violence don't understand that they're committing violence. They step on the neck of the weak and applaud themselves as though somehow they're defending the faith or defending what's right or defending the law. It's self-righteousness. To take the kingdom by force is to take God's law, given as a mechanism of our weakness, and to turn it into our strength. That is what ideology is. That is why if you think you can do the law correctly, the law can't save you. It won't work. Go back to the basics of the New Testament to understand what Matthew is saying. You can't will yourself into the kingdom. You can't force it. You have to accept defeat, not claim victory. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. All the prophets in the law have been prophesying up until John. <laughs> so everyone is so excited that John said X, Y, Z, when A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H, H were all said before John the Baptist. What about that? Just like you were saying, Father, you know, people have this ideology that it's okay to lock up people in cages, or, you know, people have an ideology that we must save the people in cages. Either way, they're incorrect because they're following their own conscience. They're following their own idea. They're following their own ideology. They're following their own idol. There's only one ideology that matters. There's only one God who matters. There's only one teaching who matters. And that is what was prophesied in the law and the prophets until John. Everyone wants to grab the kingdom of heaven, but no one wants to listen to the law and do it. When I was teaching Hebrew in Ukraine, I was sad because after the first week, half the class had dropped and I was apologizing to the department chair. 
And the department chair tisked at me, people have a dream to know Hebrew, but nobody wants to study Hebrew. Everybody wants to be in the kingdom of heaven, but no one wants to live under the law of the kingdom of heaven. This is the problem. So Jesus is contrasting those who think, I'm going to grab this kingdom of heaven the way that I want to grab it because I'm following John the Baptist or I'm following so-and-so or I'm doing this. When Jesus says, you just do what's been in the law and the prophets all this time. If you're willing to hear it, John the Baptist is Elijah. Elijah was the one who was taken up into the heavens and we didn't know what happened to him after that. He went into the heavens. He was the prophet who disappeared. The word went to the heavens. Are you willing to receive this teaching from the heavens that John the Baptist is teaching? Well, then you're going to be receiving the teaching of Elijah. And what was the teaching of Elijah? That everybody around him was worshiping Baal. (laughs) That's what Elijah was teaching. So if you're going to understand what John the Baptist taught when he said kingdom of heaven, then you got to go back to Genesis 1-1 and read to figure out what that kingdom is. Don't just grab it because it sounds nice. For heaven's sake, that's idolatry. Verse 13, 14, and 15 read as follows. Verse 13, you've been hearing what scripture says. Verse 14, if you're willing to accept it, you'll understand what it says. And verse 15, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, if you have ears, you're held accountable. There's no escaping it. If you have ears that are operational, that means you've been hearing what's been prophesied until John. So if you don't accept it, you're refusing to hear. There's no excuse. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to other children and say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. We've heard all along in this section how our judgment is impaired. What did we go out into the wilderness to see when we're called to hear in verse 15? What was it we were going to see? And since we're not going to hear and our vision is impaired, we are condemned. And now Jesus in Matthew is comparing us to children sitting around in the marketplace trying to manipulate the situation, who when John comes, bring this false accusation that he has a demon, even though he's fasting. And when Jesus comes eating and drinking, they accuse him of being gluttonous. So no matter what they see, because they're looking at it through the lens of their ideology, they're going to come to the same conclusion that the one sent from God is wicked. This is exactly what's happening in the public square in the United States. It doesn't matter what people see. They only see the darkness that is already in them. The eye is the lamp of the body. If you are controlled by ideology, you'll see a man who starves himself in the wilderness for the cause of God's teaching and accuse him of being demonic. And you'll see a man who eats and drinks with sinners and you'll accuse him of being a drunkard and gluttonous because you hate tax collectors and sinners. Yet, Matthew tells us, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. It all comes out in the wash, and there is one judge. If you have ears to hear, then you're forced to listen to this teaching. Now, when I look at you, what do I see you doing? I see you saying, maybe we can get him to do this. How come when we do what he says, he's not nice to us? Those other people who are doing the wrong thing, he's not condemning. And we're trying to pull the strings on the marionette of John the Baptist and Jesus in order to get them to be the way they should be so that we can be sure to get into the kingdom of heaven. The self-righteousness comes from my desire to be correct, my desire to own this teaching, my desire to own the kingdom of heaven. I want to be the king there. It's not good for God to be the king there. He doesn't make sense. He's not practical. And I would like him to follow a law that would be more to my liking. So maybe we can have a negotiation. No, there's no negotiation. You don't play and then he dances and no. There's one king of this kingdom. He has a law and you have to listen to it. The people are going to say whatever they're going to say 
because they want the things to look the way that they want to look and they do not have ears to hear or they're not using their ears to listen. They don't want to do what the law is telling them to do. Once again, we're betrayed by the English translation because what is translated as vindication in English is actually righteousness in the Greek. In other words, wisdom is revealed as righteous, is declared as righteous by her deeds, because it is the king of the heavenly city who ultimately in the resurrection, in his overturning of the human court, in the resurrection of Jesus, who will show that Jesus is righteous, who will declare that John the Baptist is righteous, because righteousness comes from the throne of wisdom. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.